this capacity to influence this form of change, which is what we think is crucial, right? And as a result of that, you reduce the amount of pain and suffering that individuals go through on our side of the house. But secondly, we just think in terms of quality of life, you don't have to walk or ride a horse, right? Which means that even in our even in the current status quo, if you have to take a train or if you have to take a car, we presumably prove to you that there's always going to be technological advancements, which makes it slightly more convenient for you as an individual to perform the same actions that you do in the status quo. We think this convenience is incredibly important. It allows you to have greater amounts of time to do other things in your life. It allows you to maximize agency and allows you to maximize the amount of actions that you take in this life. The whole thing then is in terms of social progress, right? We have always been more cross-pollinated. People want to move around. People move from one nation to the other in search of better opportunities, in search of better things, right? A better life. Racial biases are only removed with time because it takes time for this normalization to occur that this person can exist within the society. It takes time for normalization to occur and that can only be achieved at the point when you have given enough an amount of time for this cross-pollination to occur. At the end of the enlightenment is when individuals started moving across to different areas and that is what is incredibly crucial because in a hundred years time we can prove to you that incrementally individuals are far more normalized with like other, uh, other people of different races existing around them which means that this gets better. But the second thing I want to say is in terms of economic inequality or otherwise, right? We have the best life available to people in the status quo for poorest people as we have ever done in history. There is a reason for this. It constantly gets better in terms of individual lives. The very simple basis is that growth in terms of social progress and technological progress always goes towards getting more comfort for the individual level. And that means that this forms of uh, like economic individual at the economic level, individuals are far better off. I think if you are. The average reasonable person is probably likely to be like a line worker born in a developing nation. How, what does agency do to them and what sort of new life yeah, yeah. Come to It's very simple. A line worker 100 years ago would have been a slave. You're not a no. In another 100 years, they will have a greater amount of money to make a lot more changes in their life. In another 100 years, you have more amount of money to make more choices much better. Why do things not get worse? I want to be really uh, crucial on this. Opposition has a burden which is incredibly huge. That technological and social progress will necessarily stop is the only point in which they can outweigh our practical benefits. But even if not, and they say there's a chance of you, right? They have to prove why it will happen, considering it has ever happened before. The reason that social progress has never reverted before is that collective action has largely always been a solvable problem. Impending to has always been solved. We could have all died in a war that has existed in the past, or wiped out by a harmful virus when society never acts together. We don't, because in spite of social differences, we move towards guardrails because we believe that the pro uh, like the protection of individuals and society, the society that the, the generations before us have worked towards building has always been the crucial goal within human existence because we believe that if that doesn't exist, a quality of life depreciates and as an individual you are harmed. At that point of time, you move towards ensuring that a large chunk of this actually happens. I want to make being very clear though, because here's the thing, right? Even in their best case, even if they say, ah, there's a chance that you end up in the worst of situation and capitalism progresses regressively, which I assume is what they're going to push. You don't actually do that, right? Because the simple basis is this. While there may be greater amount of like, of, 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 of while there may be a greater jump between the poorest and the richest of people in the world, we do not think that is necessarily a bad thing. As long as these poorest people in the world have access to a greater life, treating that as a end of the world. Insofar as we prove to you that all of these things accrue to individuals, which means that individuals, even in the poorest of society, have a better life, at least they're not slaves right now, and at least they'll have a lot more money in the future, which shows to you that we uh, actually allow for better growth for individuals. That is the burden that opposition has to prove that there's incredible amount of like of doom that is possible. Insofar as they don't do that, we stand to win this debate. Extremely glad. <laughs>
some sort of a better future to exist. But then all the burden is on opposition to prove that the entire world is going to get destroyed. Sure, you would like us to do that, but we have three pieces of framing that's going to just throw them out of the round, right? Firstly, happiness is not an absolute thing, right? I consider my happiness based on things that I interact with, people that I talk about oh, yeah. around me and the kind of experiences that they have, right? Which means if we're able to prove to you that relative to the average individual who's there 100 years later, like their happiness is going to be much lesser compared to what I have relative to people around me right now is enough, right? Which means they can't really compare my quality of life at this point of time with what is going to be 100 years from now, right? If we can specifically prove to you why inequality is going to be significantly worse meaning that the median individual is going to earn much lesser than the rich person there, and why human interaction is going to reduce to the extent where we cannot be happy we think that we win that round. Second, who is the median person there? Right? The median person 100 years back was not a slave. He was probably a poor individual. Slaves were literally the worst of the worst yeah, individuals yeah. Who, yeah. Who, who faced the worst possible things. Right? We think that currently the median individual is probably a factory worker in India or someone who's working a desk job in the US. What matters to them on the other right now is what kind of benefit that they can get in efforts that they put in, right? If we can prove to you that you can become like 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 advance more in your career right now, if you probably can access happiness much more easily, we think that we win that uh, win, win the round. So certainly in terms of how exactly the world is going to look like, right? There's a lot of moving parts, which means that Gov cannot just come and tell you that there is some, oh, we've seen this in the last hundred years, and that's enough. That kind of inclusion is not going to be enough to fulfill that burden, right? What you need to talk about is things that are inherent, things that you see in systems right now that are going to continue in, in terms of how it evolves, right? What exactly have humans evolved as and how exactly are going to do that? We never saw any sort of clarity that came from opening government yeah, yeah. because they just told you that, oh, we need to, like, we want individual comfort, right? And they never told you why the average median person's comfort is going to be considered. My first argument, we're going to tell you why what counts as comfort, why this kind of inequality is going to be more to like favor that it should favor people who already have access to resources right now. First, let's look at what is certain in the status quo, right? Power, wealth, and information is concentrated within a few individuals. And so note that these are the most important factors of success. If you have capital, you can invest it in the right places and build wealth that you can protect for generations, right? If you have information, it knows you know exactly what to do with the kind of resources and the kind of talent that you have to get those kind of benefits to begin with. But second, capitalism is how we've evolved. And even if they want to come and tell that the current biggest force like China is probably going to rule over the world, even there, note that you have things like oligarchs, right? You have some people who have access to these kind of like resources and largely do that in the first place. But thirdly, we think that the consequence of the pie getting bigger it, 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 it does not really work there because you're not distributing that much more equally to everybody right now, right? Which is why the most important takeaway from this argument is that if the median person 100 years from now is going to put much more effort to advance in their career, right? Take much more effort to get the kind of basic things that give them joy, we think that it's a horrible thing. How then is all of these inherent factors that exist right now going to manifest into inequality, right? We think that there is a compounding effort over time. There's going to be no big force that is likely to break this completely. Why do we think there is, right? Because of things like social movements not being effective. Why? Because the point in history where we've seen mass social movements be powerful is when people suffered in abject poverty. That's not what we're telling is going to happen, right? Because by their own analysis, 
If the pie becomes bigger, I'm probably slightly happier and don't give a fuck and don't like engage in this kind of movements that break down the kind of structures that exist, right? No, like, no. It's not benevolence of people that we can rely on and that extremely rich people will do nice things to individuals, right? So thirdly, we think that the access to information is going to be actively within the like hands of few people. Things like technology, things like drugs are literally going to be like because of patents and IP laws are going to be accessible only by few individuals who will reap the benefits of this largely. Sure, even if you can find like a cure for malaria or something like that, we're not very sure how every person in the world, the average person in the world is able to get some benefit from that or yeah. why we actually will do that in 100 years from now, right? Know that that's very important. Why then is all of this bad? Because of two things. One, human beings care about the results they get from the effort they put, right? Which means things like disappointment, things like regret, the fact that I, I studied really hard Hard request and did not get from good right. Right? that I struggle with my partner and we after putting an effort we still are not together things like these are because the amount of effort that I put does not get you to that result at the end of the day no, no. if there is more inequality it means that you need to work harder to get above that particular ladder secondly at the point at which the difference between the maximum income and the median income keeps on increasing it means that the access to opportunities is also going to reduce for the average person over time which means we're able to prove that no matter how much the pie gets bigger if it's not distributed equally all of their benefits do not stand before i talk about how human interaction is going to reduce a violence horrible cg the rockefeller family probably existed the arnold family probably exists now like why is oligarchy going to change anyway like a hundred years irrespective uh dude that's literally our point they're going to get significantly worse and your life is going to become worse so we're not very sure what you're arguing for Second, even if you don't believe any bit about inequality in terms of the human interaction, right, why then do we think that it's going to reduce significantly? The internet, most of technology makes money based off of people's attention. Three points here. One, the services currently that exist in the internet are often based on screen time and ensuring that you look at those things, right? You pay for those things. You engage with that kind of technology, which means there's constantly a need for entertainment to take over things, for entertainment and the virtual economy to be built. Second, virtual economies are significantly huge because it's easier for you to build them. It's easier for you to scale them over real things, right? And there's things that you need to force people to opt into, which means they're going to engineer them in such a manner. With that, people will need escapes from their life at some point of time. And this is going to get significantly worse, right? Because they never told you why there are going to be less of crisis on their side of the house. Sure, even if you have better health care, even if climate change has become slightly better, we're not very sure why the shocks are going to reduce significantly, right? We told you that inequality is going to increase also, which means that your life probably gets slightly shittier and you would want these escapes more. What does this mean? Which means more people are going to take their attention away from individual human conversations and move on to things like this, right? The fact that you get instant gratification from <laughs> things that we see in the status quo itself are going to get significantly worse. This is bad because human beings are social animals. You need this kind of interaction to build up your personality. And if you can't talk to other people when you're growing up, if you can't build your personality from interacting with your friends, we're unsure what you are as a human being, which means no, you're going to become a sadder human being. Because we told you exactly how things are going to evolve in the future, why that's going to be a horrible thing based on inherent things that exist in the status quo. Board. Board. I may already be I'll start in three. I'll start in three, two, one. The life of people is better right now than 200 years ago. Response from Harshit can't be no. I don't think that's enough. I think the problem with their side is they don't agree with the fact that economic growth will exist on both sides. They don't prove to you that economic growth suddenly stops and that is why oligarchs will still hold enough power. Insofar, I prove to you that the inequality gap doesn't exist when they necessarily talk about the idea of comparative happiness based on relative utility also doesn't stand. Why it doesn't stand? 
because economic growth is consistent on both sides. Note, 100 years ago, it was only few countries which had economic growth, and that's why you had only few oligarchs. You necessarily had only few companies controlling the fucking world, because it was extremely harder for you to access resources to compete with them in the first place. Sure. Right now, access to resources is easier, because you necessarily have democratization of resources in the first place. Yeah. Developing countries were able to catch up. They were able to create skills industries for themselves. They were able to create financial levers for themselves because they're able to take loans and create manufacturing hubs for themselves as well. That is why you necessarily do not have more amount of oligarchs and more amount of inequality gap because they were never necessarily not able to hold resources. But secondly, their argument is contingent upon some sort of duopolies or monopolies particularly existing and that is why the competition is so high, competition is so low that these people are able to extract extra money for themselves. That doesn't happen because the access to compete with this industry in increases over time because it's easier for you to increase this have to have technological things like AI and ML because you don't need enough resources to access it in the first place. All of those things you necessarily only require orders to do this for you. But more importantly, because automation will also increase, it means that you're not able to depend upon hiring more and more number of people, which means that better ideas will exist for more period of time, which means that better ideas would be able to compete with this oligarch, which means that there will be led more and more about the democratization of the wealth itself. But lastly and more importantly, because you necessarily need the rise of automation and AI to increase, you also need more and more number of skilled workers. I'm not really sure why people would remain poor on their yeah. paradigm. The guy on the average though, which he has a desktop, probably now handles an AI and probably learns coding in Udemy. The reasoning is simple, because everyone needs to upskill. The moment you upskill more and more, you become less and less dispensable. All of those reasons mean that you have at least some sort of more and more amount of dispensable income. What does this prove to you? This proves to you that economic growth, because it exists, and because the access to this economic growth is extremely democratized, the inequality gap is not something which exists. What is the worst case on our side? That it remains constant and the gap is not shortened up. I'm willing to bite that bullet because here is what everything always says. Healthcare gets drastically easier. The diabetic medicine which you get for $1,500 becomes $50 because medical research converses for next 100 years, which means that the people are poorer people who are more and more diabetic have more and more access to things like medicine. The paychecks which they get is more and more because the amount of money you have in the pie is still more than what we have right now, which is to say even if this... 10% becomes 5% because it's just more money, we're able to access more and more amount of agency. Because the more and more money you have, which means that the more and more greater access to schools and everything else. Even if that is not the case, you have more and more access to things like health, education, and so on. What is the weighing of all of this? Note that they can just claim that technological advances, things like singularity, or access to greater agency does not happen at all. Which means that you have to buy that in advance to a some degree. Which means that if you can't read this debate on certainty, what you ought to read this debate on in terms of you should take this risk or not. Because they can't prove that medical advances dies every single time and you will magically die at 10 in the last 100 years, which means that you will probably live at least worst case in our world 50, not 80. But in our world, in our best case, you probably live more and more 100 and 120 with better access to resources. That means you ought to take this risk because you don't know how many lifetimes you live. You only live once, which means that the chance of maximization of agency only remains in our paradigm because there's nothing which remains in there, which means that you ought to take this risk regardless. But secondly, and more importantly, I want to weigh this in terms of likelihood of things happening. Note, every single social movement got better for 100 years because people get more and more aware about why those are issues. Social movements need time because you need people to convince of your issues. The movement's rights movement necessarily got better after 1967. People always try to have and strive for greater agency because that's what human condition is assigned to. The only main metric on this debate then becomes about utilitarianism, which is to say that where you get the chance of maximization of your choice, 
which means we get that better because because humans make a world for future generations where they have more access to agency in the first place. The reason why you are able to do this because you want to fight this for your present self as well. Women fighting right now for change, all the women rights changes necessarily makes it a better world for women who are going to be born in next hundred years because that becomes a better world for themselves. That is why social progress is much better in our paradigm because they can't just move that movements don't work at all. That is extreme worst case engagement. We don't think that's the right thing to do. Before I move on, to see you. Even if incomes are increased, they will likely to become linear job due to market saturation. How is the On an average, both increases, right? Like, what the fuck? Like, if someone who earns a million dollars on five million, the guy who's already 50 bucks also starts earning 150. If both of them comparatively increase, at the worst, if the access to things are much better, he has access to healthcare, he makes sure that he lives for 120. I don't know by living longer is suffering because death is the ultimate suffering. Abhay told you the chances of similarity are extremely high, which is to say that you necessarily reach a world where you preserve yourself and reach to utmost immortality. But more importantly, technologically advances value that because these poor people now use buses, in our world at least they are able to use cars and save their lifetime and minutes of their lifetime, right? Which is to say that there are at least a better chance of quality of life on a fucking comparative and not really sure what the debate is there. How you are ought to judge this debate then? On both sides, what happens in the future is largely speculative. Which is to say, you don't know for certain what Hashim says is true or what Abhay says is true. What you're supposed to do then is the propensity of your all to take the risk or not based on the benefits versus harms. At worst, the harm is you lose 20 to 10 years. At worst, that you're slightly sad. In our world, your propensity to be happy and give a much longer life with better quality of life is way higher than the harm that is reported. For all of those reasons, then, could not be more harm. <laughs> Okay, I don't know why three speakers didn't do thank yous, but I'm going to board judges because it's a final. Yes. Yes. And it's why we yes. do thank yous, Mahal. <laughs> yes. I'm just going to keep it very short. I'm just going to list out things, names, whatever. Hadar, my debate coach, thank you for existing. Yes. My dear junior CD is very proud of you all. Your food was a very, very good tournament. Thank you for letting me speak at this comp. And it was a really, really fun experience. And my sock, no better stage to thank you all than this stage. <laughs> And lastly, of course, last but not the least, teammate Harshit. Always been amazing, always been fun to debate with you. That being said, thank you out of the way. <laughs> uh, I'll be beginning my speech in three, two, one. Before any clashes, the most important clarification to make from opening up. Intuition check. I can't compare myself to a Stone Age man and say that I have Netflix right now. That's why my life is better than a Stone Age man. Your life is defined by how you feel relative to your surroundings. In this moment, if I had a bar to show, hey, this is how good I feel. And in that moment, I have a bar to show, hey, this is how good I feel. The bar is higher right now is what we pose. Which means any arguments on how I have tech, I have AI, and that's why my stuff is easier to do are of clash because you need to prove that relative to the time then you become happier. What does this response manifest in, right? This response manifests in simple things like them sneakily getting away with the way that I live extra years so my life is better, right? This For that to work, they need to prove that relative to my surroundings, my life is better to begin with. But now, go. 
even if you don't think that that is true, coming to why opening government is out of this debate. On first, on their clash of, on their claim of less pain and suffering happens. Why? Because two things. One, medical tech advances. Two, is because you can enjoy your life more, right? They proved incentive to enjoy life. They never proved the capacity that I have to enjoy yeah. life. Insofar as I prove that economic inequality is worse, you have lesser capacity to enjoy life to begin with. But yes, that's premised on me proving economic equality after the rebuttals, which I do later. And second, is on medical tech, surgical advancements, AI, etc. If I am an average, if I am a person right now who's aligned, I found a person later who's debugging AI codes 100 years later. You can't claim quality of life is better because I'm working behind a laptop. Your quality of life is still bad because you still are relatively worse than all the other people around you. Which means at that point, you prolong in your medical health, you prolong this to 120 years, becomes a reverse pain because it becomes worse on them if they prolong this bad life and suffering both, right? So then... Yes, talking about their next claim on more agency and how humans have always moved towards this and social movements make minorities' lives better, right? First, I'm going to say, I don't care about minorities in this debate. This is about the interest of individuals, right? Which means that the average reasonable person is an Indian born in India, is an American born in the US. If I can prove that life for a white person is better, I already win this debate if I'm in the US. If I prove that life for a Hindu is better in India, I already win this debate because that's the interest of an average reasonable individual and that's more most of the interests of most of the people that live here, right? But that's why all things on social movements are off clash out of this debate because they never even proved or never even paid why I should care about vulnerable stakeholders to begin with, right? But then third is they can't just say that ah social movements always have been evolving that they've been giving people more agency to deal with their life hence i can do more things in life and i will be happier well guess what my agency right now is very high because 100 years ago i probably couldn't go on an airplane or probably couldn't go like i don't know paragliding that's why my agency is more that argument doesn't work because you still don't have the capacity to do so at the point at which you don't have this economic equality. Now, tying everything back to our clash on economic equality. We told that you can't use the metric that 100 years ago, stuff was like this. And right now, stuff is like this. That's why I'll extrapolate this logic to 100 years later. Three things inherently told you that are present right now that makes stuff 100 years later worse. First is media. It did not exist 100 years ago. Rich people have the power to control media and the way in which social media messages go out. Which means rich people have the power to go ahead and control the control people's ideas and minds significantly more easily. Second is about tech. The, the, if they want to put all their eggs or all their baskets in tech or drug research or AI, etc. The funding, this comes from people who have the aptitude to do this. From investors that can give money to these startups or these companies that can go ahead and do this. Which means the control of how this is distributed lies within them. Which means that the advancements that they're pushing their hope on literally lie in the hands of these people. And thirdly, is that... Okay, only two things actually. But yes, <laughs> then... Why does political power not work? This was the third. They said that uh, people 100 years later were also billionaires. They also had positions of power, which means 100 years later, also everything will stay the same and people will have positions of power that time also. This does not work because we don't give you analysis for why people just get wealthier as a whole. We give you analysis for why people get wealthy using the tools that we have today and how they can be used in a bad way. No response from Mansija on those specific inherits, which means anything he said about about comparing stuff uh, otherwise I was not on the clash in this debate right but then talking about what were the two most important contributions in our debate one of which actually like completely unresponded to like why did you not respond to interpersonal interactions anyway i'm going to weigh this as significantly important in this debate right first a scale of impact you literally interact with people every single day if we can prove that if media has moved your life in a way where you interact your interaction with people get worse it means that you actively feel harm about it every single day and every single interaction of 300 people sit yeah. with right now if my quality of interaction wasn't good with them i would feel bad about it second is extent of impact your whole life is affected your childhood your self-esteem is contingent on the way in which you talk to people the way in which you think is defined by the kind of conversations you have when you're adolescent you're mentally you're mentally least stable and you have the you you have the most sensitivity with respect to what yeah. people say to you and how that defines you which means if we can prove that the quality of the way in which people interact with each other gets worse it means that this compounding effect on every single person's life and it has effect on you throughout your whole life right before i move on closing please i have a very pessimistic view of the current world undercuts a major portion of your face because you do not have a comparison 
Presumably, a lot of people already live a very, very bad life. Right? Explain my status quo is good enough. Okay. Giving a very pessimistic view of the current world just means saying in this debate that the debate is about how I'm going to have a better view later and how I'm going to have a better view now than later. We are pessimistic, but life gets worse 100 years later. That's the comparative you need to deal with. And those are the, I mean, yeah, anyway, I don't need to respond to that one. So, yes, then on the second clash and why that is also something that we base of significant importance over what they said in this debate, right? Or why greater inequality means that people have a lower and worse life, right? This has compounding weight, right? Understand that if you go ahead and not achieve what we're planning to do, the most inherent thing to a human is they set out goals for themselves, small goals, like I want to buy a chocolate or whatever, or I want to become a scientist. And if you don't achieve those goals, you feel bad. This is the this is the underlying cause for every single bad thing that happens to humans mentally to begin with, which means if your ability to go ahead and get something that you want gets worse because of inequality, it has compounding effects on you every single day. It means that your ability to go ahead and think that you want to get something else also gets affected, which means your confidence in going ahead and believing in yourself to go ahead and something in that status quo in that paradigm also gets affected panel if you want to remember one thing from my speech remember this that you don't define the world you don't define your quality of life by how stuff around you changes you define your quality of life by how you feel internally and how that bar of how i feel right now increases or decreases extremely proud of you. <laughs> I just need to give a speech with 10 people sign a government and then we'll come together. All right, um, POI, one second. Yeah, POI opening, if not closing. All right, five minutes and 30 seconds. Don't shout, otherwise, I'll also verbally shut you down. Just say that was starting in three, starting in three, two. But I think opening has two throwaway lines. Developing countries will catch up. Then they say racial biases will change over time. There's no mechanization in a policy debate how this trajectory exponentially changes to the extent that it becomes more inclusive for individuals in general. First extension then, why immigration exponentially increases in 100 years, making the world less white and more brown, specifically giving more access to individuals at the ground. Firstly, we think individuals in the developing world are largely to increase in terms of the population over time. They have higher fertility rates, they're largely in terms of population under the present status quo. This means the kind of migration that's likely to happen to the developed world is significantly going to increase as people look for better jobs. But secondly, the integration in terms of globalization and global supply chains largely means that people would migrate abroad like to essentially get better quality of life etc because note here the present status quo means that there is concentration of resources in the hands of a few countries and comparatively there's less amount of resources for other countries in terms of colonization and the kind of things that have atrocities that have happened in the past so the only way you reach an equilibrium is when you access potential and opportunities that are already there in the developed world that is the way it trickles down to the developing world that's the clearest mechanism that you can imagine but fourthly, we also feel immigration is likely to be higher. Like even if 
because one probably left leaning political parties are always going to push for this in the first place to begin with but the developed countries would also compete with each other to get access to the talent pool from the developing world to essentially ensure that the industries to remain competitive and you essentially have migrants coming in to essentially ensure that uh, there's more amount of diversity and more amount of skills and talents that you're likely to import which means to say uh, we think in a hundred years of time immigration is going to be significantly more like huge under the present status quo if you like, say for example someone from the indian origin background who's become the prime minister of the uk it's more likely to happen throughout like in more compared more numbers in the developed world like 100 years down the line because immigration is exponentially likely to increase in that scenario what does that do then i think the first thing that it does it tackles problems in terms of perception and racism that largely increase which stems from the west in terms of otherization that these countries push forward which is where more people in say for example positions of power or get that amount of visibility in the first place i think it's more likely that these things become normalized over time but these individuals have incentives to give back to their home country it's the clearest way how developing countries then improve on our side of the house tackling opening opposition that well oligopoly suggests some like large countries would exist over years in china first thing to say here i think you have remittances that these individuals send home but secondly to say i think what it creates is it creates a sense of visibility i think the reason why racism stems is because yeah, yeah. people feel in the developing world are not competent enough. They don't have the skills. They won't be able to compete in the economy and be as successful and efficient. So point in which you have more people entering these spaces, like more Indians in the Silicon Valley, I think at that point of time, it breaks the overturn window, of creating more of a visibility in the first place, which means that when these individuals occupy more positions of power, you're likely to reinvest back into your home country in that particular instance, like Microsoft setting up businesses in India and stuff like that, which means this visibility is going to massively increase in 100 years, like essentially ensuring that investment Investment flows back into the developing world, or at least they get a sense of visibility and recognition, which presently it's very less, but it's comparatively likely to be way higher in 100 years' time. What it does is, I think at that point of time, developing countries have a clearer way, like it's a clear mechanism why they would be able to develop more and would be at a better place to compete. Or say, for example, you being born in the developing world would essentially mean better for you at the end of the day as an individual. I think that clearly tackles the reason why in 100 years of time, you'd have better access to opportunities through the kind of industries and businesses that are more likely to be set up but also in terms of racism and otherization yeah, yeah. i would note that it's more likely that say for example things like media and say for example discourse that is largely going to happen is going to expand over 100 years of time yeah. it's more likely that people will become more educated they have more access to resources and more individuals can like essentially get that sense of visibility right. which means the way social movements actually change is when you have more amount of representation coming from these backgrounds in the developed world where you can actually create these narratives that largely then trickle down into a developing world that people can pick up on it I think at that point of time, the amount of media visibility that you get, the kind of, say, for example, like protest movements that you create, also the power of social media is exponentially likely to increase. So more and more people having access to technology means they can voice their opinions comparatively more than they would have been able to 100 years when people lived in isolated bubbles. Like you never knew what went wrong in that neighborhood. You never knew what went back in that particular part of the world. Literally right now, even if there's a small problem in some part of the world, some small country suffering, that literally blows up into a global issue simply because of the proliferation of technology and social media. Yeah, that exists like an exponential increase over 100 years of time because of internet proliferation and stuff like that is people will be able to voice their opinions and concerns way more freely even if they live in small isolated pockets anywhere in the world i think at that point of time they're able to access agency right. literally what they claim on opening opposition is better achieved than on our side of the house lastly that work-life balance why it changes fast go ahead Dude, your case literally relies on the benevolence of people like Sunak who are lesser in number and very privileged, especially when he's a man who wants to reduce immigration. Got it. Immigration increases over time, increases in 100 years. More people come into positions of power. Reason why they won't turn against you simply because they also have children who would attend those schools. They also have individuals who would be of that young close ones in their families. So point at which you increase polarization of society, these individuals are also likely to be affected as a consequence. That's why these individuals have the incentive to ensure that the, it becomes more accommodating and cohesive for individuals in these spaces. Why does work-life balance change specifically? Because we think oligopolies and oligarchs would still exist. What changes is economy moves towards the tertiary sector from primary and secondary, which is a move from agriculture and manufacturing into IT and tech. This is the clearest thing that's going to happen because one, resources are going to drain out because coal, petroleum, what exists, say for example, in 100 years, which is people have to move towards like technology in the first place to begin with. I don't think opening gives you this mechanism, but the impact is fairly clear, which means one, I think that 
gap between people in terms of accessibility changes. If you're working in manufacturing or mining, compared to even if you're doing a low level job in a tech field or in the tertiary sector of the economy, you're going to have to conceptualize growth in that much more easier. But secondly, I think it puts less stress on individuals simply because the, the physical labor changes into say, for example, say, like think in, in which you use cognition comparatively more or your mental ability comparatively more, which basically means in that domain, you're more likely to save up time, like reduce the amount of physical stress that would affect individuals in that regard. I think that basically means that literally by working in offices is comparatively more comfortable than literally you having to strive, strive in those agrarian fields, say 100 years ago. So which means at that point of time, I think the comfort that individuals can derive and a vast majority of them would significantly increase. And we are obviously upscale people and transition them like that has happened, like through like vocational training, education, etc. of individuals move from the agrarian economy post like into the manufacturing, post the industrial revolution, which is point in which when you move into that sector, you have more amount of time in your own hands. Conceptualizing growth is also comparatively easier because of more access to resources, time, and the kind of like leverages that you have, which is in that regard, the work-life balance significantly becomes better. People literally do jobs that are more comforting than literally being stressful at the end of the day. We think, we prove very clearly why you have more amount of uh, diversity in, through immigration, but more importantly, you also have like work-life balance and individuals are better able to access for those reasons, closing up. <laughs> I am Ganasha Kuriyash, uh, member of BOP. Uh, I'll take Vigo as specific to Sodium, but not to Sodium alone. Straight up. Uh, yeah, starting my speech in three, two, one. Part of my problem with opening is while they make a solid case as to why the future might be good or bad, no housing gauges with white today or white right now is necessarily a positive good and I would prefer to then be born today. Which is why the key construction that comes from our side of the house is that right now at this point in time, specifically 2023, is the best time or rather is a better time to be born than in the future. Why we say this is nearly because of the um like this, the, the, the plateauing of innovation that happens and necessarily the benefits that one gets by being born at the right place at the right time and we think that right now is the right place at the right time right but for taking uh, taking on the other houses OG has two major pushes one is to say that incomes are higher which means that even if the gap between incomes increases we still think that this is better off three responses to this one I think the reason that the way that capitalism works necessarily is that exploitation exists which is to say that therefore if even if the gap or between like places if, if, is, to, is to increase at that point then they concede to our case because we think that the way that the rich get richer is by the exploitation of the poor which means that even if incomes are necessarily net increase compared to Today, we still think that the exploitation does not go away and therefore they do not like successfully mitigate that harm. But second, I think that fulfillment doesn't necessarily come from incomes at a point in time when, as I tried to establish my POI as well, I think jobs are likely to become more menial in, insofar as jobs are likely to become more repetitive and the more, like in the saturated, saturated market, right? CG comes in with this idea that like, okay, IT industry is better than like farming because it's less menial and less stressful. But I think that IT, IT jobs can still be quite menial and insofar as we yeah, yeah. know that, that like opportunities can, like the, there is a saturation market, we don't think that opportunities necessarily increase to warrant the increase in population, especially given the fact that like jobs are equally disappearing, right? So I don't see why that should be credited. I think it's a wash. If jobs are created, jobs will disappear, right? But third, I think that like material benefit only comes or only makes sense to the point where material benefit is comparative, which is to say that even if I'm better off as I am today, I still don't feel less fulfilled because on a comparative, I still earn less than like my rich counterpart, or I still earn less compared to like the rich, right? Which is to say that even if I have like more income right now, the sense of fulfillment is better reduced because I understand that like, that needs are comparative, which is also to say that like as, as soon as like I know that. 
other people have a height that he is fulfilled better than I am. That also means that I don't myself to fulfill it, right? But second, on the side of like social progress and equality, right? I think Oko's response is to say that the debate is not about minorities. We like to say that even if the debate is not about minorities, we still don't think minorities are better off in their set house simply because we don't think we think it's uncharitable to say that all equality will just suddenly appear on hundred years from now. We think there's a lot of like reasons that we don't like necessarily understand in terms of like we don't know what to fix. Which is also to say that in hundred years it's equally likely that current like microaggressions and current acts of inequalities will simply be solidified. Which over which is to say that as a person from a minority, I feel I'm likely to be more helpless because I feel like whatever I what like whatever I have to face has been solidified for a further hundred years. Which then means that minorities are likely to be more helpless on our side, which means that they are like less better off, right? But then what does CG say? Once he said that opposite like access to options is a lot better, we think that that's inexclusive because folks are also likely to disappear because of the of technology, right? But second, they tell us why work life balance is likely to be better because of ID and rooms of tech. I don't see why that's why that is necessarily likely given that we know why the jobs can like. It can be extremely bully, but say uh, ruling. But secondly, I don't buy their their narrative that like every country will now move to like tertiary no, sectors instead no, no. of agricultural sectors. Because simply because the way that like some countries are endowed with more natural resources means that they are more likely to then have agricultural based economies simply because the rest of the world then depends on them for those agricultural economies. Right? So I don't buy their characterization that like everyone will suddenly become uh, tertiary. I take you on that here. Yeah. Yeah, no side from the economic gap of the UK, even if the rich makes you feel bad, at least you live longer, at least the basic freedom which you don't have right now, that's still on a comparison. I think I think okay, fine. Understand you know, I, and I mean, and I, I'll come and address you like what is better to me, right? One is like you need a level of material comfort, but only level of material comfort that then gives you a comparative sort of like uh, understanding or a comparative sort of fulfillment in the sense that it's not my job to necessarily be like I think we get more happiness when we're deemed to be successful compared to our peers than like necessarily would like have a level of material comfort. That at that point, I think that buying into the fact that gap increases necessarily works against them. But second, I think that it's also important for them to have fulfilling work. I think because of job saturation, because of everything that overall tells you, I don't think it's likely that. Like fulfilling work is likely to exist. But yeah. what I think it's important for them to then be like having agency or having that right? Right now. So then getting more main constructive as to the exclusivity of being born at this time specifically, right? Understand that all of these things that I just talked about in terms of like comparative success or whatever is to a large extent dependent on being born at the right place at the right time, right? Bill Gates would not be that successful if he wasn't born at the right time, which is to say that it was at the cusp of innovation in terms of technology, etc. Right. Which to then say and this is our, our claim is that 2023 is the perfect time to be born insofar as it is the perfect time where there's a balance between like innovation, but the innovation has not been developed. So to the perfect extent where like everyone is, is expected to know this innovation, which is then to say that like anyone who then gets an idea to like cause this innovation is rather greater like likelihood to then go ahead and be successful and like go ahead and be better as for the framework that we've already said, right? We think that innovation has like a diminishing curve, which says that in 100 years the rate of innovation will be much less, which means that the ability to like take advantage of the innovation that exists in 2023 in terms of like AI technology, etc., yeah. is essentially like better off in terms of being a fulfilling work, but also in terms of the third that I get to, which is in terms of agency, right? The ability to control like your future and like what job markets look like. And like what, um, like that that can sort of case actually look like. Uh, I think the UI for opening close the Yeah, close. What is the inflection point at which technology reduces to the extent it becomes ne negative utility? We clearly do why it becomes a positive utility in the future. I think it's irrelevant to, to like enter into like exactly what this inflection point will be. Insofar as we show that it's diminishing, which is to say that if the likelihood is like ten times right now, we just have to show you that that likelihood reduces in the future. Which is to say that even if like two like like technological or whatever like innovations are happening, as long as we prove that there are more technological innovations happening right now, as long as we establish the fact that there is a diminishing curve in terms of like the fact that like there are only certain ideas that can exist and you can't go beyond that, I think that is like what's more important as far as like that gives me greater access to then go ahead and take advantage of these innovations, right? But we also want to prove like so, like why twenty twenty what like why hundred years from now is unlikely to involve like less struggle in rough itself, right? One like in terms of like technology, just like that, but taking over jobs. Second in terms of job saturation, but also in terms of like climate change, right? Like even if you do not believe that like climate change is a thing, we think that the stress of the optics of climate change being a thing is necessary now to then make living or being born in a time where like climate change is largely out of your control a most stressful time to be in. Which is to say that like right now I have some greater sense of agency in the sense that like my actions or my government's actions can actually then go ahead and like fix climate change. But how did you now unlike the other that definitely right? but also in terms of like the mental health crisis and we think that the developed world has this as well which at that point i won't buy like cg standing with regards to like immigration because i don't think that like on a comparative we necessarily see that as better right but i'm even willing to say that even if like life in the future involves a struggle i still see that that's a bad thing because i necessarily think that happiness is not does not exist in a vacuum you need like a certain level of suffering to necessarily be happy which is also to say that suffering will exist 100 years from now we just don't know what that looks like so they come and can't come in and say that we are like less suffering compared to now because there's also be more stuff more stuff 
suffering in other ways. Right? For all the reasons that I've already said, and for all the reasons that I said that they're likely to actually be more struggling. Right? So what are we told you today? One hundred years from now, there's less likely, there's less likely to be like a uh, situation where there's no struggle. Even if there is less struggle, we don't think that that necessarily means that we will be more happy. Secondly, we told you that even a hundred years from now, there is less struggle. It's still better to be born now and to expect fulfillment. And more importantly, told me, we tell you an exclusive case for why being on the cusp of like technical technology called me the point that right now is the best time to be born. And we're the only we're the only team that gives you a positive case of being born now and not as negative case for not being born later. With that proud to from do you want me to have my name? No, 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 Shout out to DTU because Angad forces me to. Other than that, uh, it's nice to be back on the same stage. We took a fourth from CD last year. Woo! Let's go again. Does it look like with this? Ooh. Starting my speech in. Starting my speech in three, two, one. The problem with everybody in this debate is that they don't pick the correct frame. Happiness is probably something that you cannot predict. Wealth is something that you cannot predict. The only thing that you can certainly predict in this round is the fact that there's going to be a population explosion and population are going to exponentially increase over a period of time. The reason for this is the fact that over themselves say that you can't judge this debate based on what happened 100 years ago, which possibly also means that you can't necessarily predict whether happiness is going to be something that you're going to achieve later or probably or sadness is something that you're going to achieve later. Population explosion was the most important frame in the round for two specific reasons. The first was that developing countries uniquely have population explosions which the developed world did not. The reason for this is the fact that when family planning failed in the developing world and when people didn't like rising through poverty, the way in which they wanted to garner happiness is via the means of having more and more children. Insofar as that education did not exist in the developed world, we just think that there's a disproportionate amount of population explosion on the developing world. This mattered because we think that once there's a crunch of resources that people have in the developing world, they would incrementally want to move outside and immigrate and hence probably get a good quality of life that themselves. That in and of itself was most important because that was the premise that was going to bring up uh, proof immigration in this round. The only observation I want to do, do on Wayne is to say that this was the frame that was more certain because top half is a wash on whether you can have exponentially more wealth later or happiness. We just don't think to prove why this is certainly the most important thing. The second thing that we did was to actually impact how we are going to get social change once immigration occurs and once people from the developing world start moving to the developed world because obviously there are more people in the developed world and less in the, in the more people in the developing world and less in the developed. Obviously, there's going to be an equilibrium mechanism through which people are going to move into the developing world and probably bring some amount of change. There were four ways in which we uniquely proved social change. The first thing we said is the fact that more visibility in and of itself reduces the ability for people or in the like or Bikes to, uh, to probably oppress against the black. The reason for this is the fact that the, the, the root cause of racism was the fact that these people never considered black no. people not now. Black people competent or or like racial people competent, and that is the thing that we think that insofar as that exposure did not exist, we do not think that racism could have been solved exponentially. Then, if more and more people start getting into these uh, getting into developed countries, obviously the exposure that white people are going to have to these ideologies is going to substantially increase. Number two, we said that when more people come. Obviously, that means that there's more, there could be more political capital even within parties within the developed world to go and cater to these specific minority vote banks. The example of this is the fact that literally the Tories in, um, in the UK have so many Indian leaders because they know that they have to cater to a specific Indian vote bank, and that in and of itself leads to lots of political change. So, the very existence of lots of people means that political parties in the developed world have a natural incentive to create more vote banks. The final thing we said is the fact that social movements have probably shifted online. The only response that opening opposition has is that social movements have failed in the Past and then they're going to also get right now. I think this is uncharitable because you have to explain what this is true, why this is going to be true in the future as well. I would just note that if more and more people start becoming a part of social movements, obviously the incremental amount of change that they'll be about they'll be able to bring is also substantially higher by the virtue of the fact that they one they have critical mass, but more importantly, governments will have to not ignore them because they have the greater number of people who obviously form a major vote bank for the vast amounts of these governments. This mattered because one, it was reliant on the frame that was most certain in this round 
wrong. But secondly, we just think that racism is something that is a far more important impact for people as opposed to other things. I want to be racism in this round and explain why this change uniquely matters than every other thing. The first thing I would say is the fact that this is the sort of change that directly affects your self-perception because this is the thing that is far more proximate to you. Presumably, people who are poor find ways to adjust to their life just because they have less resources doesn't mean they live a very, very sad life. They probably find ways to adjust to the resources. But we think the harm to racism or people telling you every day that you're that you, you that you should not have the color that you want is something that sticks with you for a much more amount of time. So one, this is more proximate, but secondly, this is the harm that continually affects you as opposed to the stuff on resources that talk of, talks about. The yeah. final thing I would not know. The final thing I would say is the fact that this is the precursor to economic benefits in the round because you can't really utilize money until you aren't really happy with the quality of life that you have, but more importantly, if you do not have an enhanced perception of self. Racism independently wins up the debate against all other discussions that talk of have. Before I start engaging with talk of food. Why is it in the incentive of the developing world leaders to take so many people that contact theory works? The likely outcome is just that people in India continue to die because of overpopulation. But like you have to explain why won't they move? Like you should have explained why they will have to stick with the developing world. That is where I want to clash with open opposition. What they assume is the fact that because China and Russia are bad, they are probably going to be bad 100 years as well. I would just note that this is something that is super symmetric because we explained that the behavior of oligarchs isn't going to change regardless. What is going to change is the other side of the political spectrum where more and more people will go and, and argue for change against these specific oligarchs. But the second thing I would just note is the fact that the incentive mechanism that OA has for why wealth is not going to be redistributed are relatively unlikely because they don't exactly prove why just because developed countries are super bad, they're going to be bad in the future as well. The final thing I would just note is the fact that having a pessimistic view of the world is also detrimental equally for all case because go, go, going from good to bad is substantially different from going bad to worse because presumably there's no comparative or talk as to why quality of life right now is substantially better. They don't justify their sort of the comparative and hence I don't think they can win this debate. The final thing, the final observation on OO is the fact that they say that happiness is relative and it can be judged by our surroundings. One, this is super symmetric because presumably like you, you can assess this probably, so you can have your surroundings later after 100 years as well, so it's unclear as to why that is the mechanism that benefits them the most. But the second Anything they say is the fact that human interaction is better. This is the metric that we directly engage with as opposed to opening up with. OG just says that we can have more resources that don't exactly explain as to how the quality of human interaction is going to become substantially better. We on closing government uniquely prove that when you have an enhanced perception of self or when other people think that you're not that bad of a person, this directly fulfills the metric that opening up position has on human interactions. So one, we engage with the metric, but secondly, we also explain why the benefit of racism is highly in this round as opposed to economic resources. Let's now come to opening government. I would just note about opening government that a lot of their case is very, very assertive. The first thing they just say is the fact that, oh, the developing world was bad, it's become good now, so probably it's going to become better 100 years later as well. The problem is, this is super uncertain. Our frame on why population explosion is the most certain thing in the round is something that is far more certain as opposed to wealth. The second thing I would just note is the fact that democratization is protected time. It, the fact that the democratization of wealth is the pre, is only when like the people in the developed world actually think that they have to lend rights to people in the developing world. That can't happen until you uniquely generate political capital. We just think that that opening government does not have the exact incentive mechanisms for why the developed world will be so atheistic that it will want to give to the developing world. Probably all scholars is correct until top half. We explain uniquely that the political capital that communities gather to go out and fight for change versus political parties in the developed world substantially increases, and that is the mechanism that actually un un unlocks democratization of wealth as long as we explain that this political capital is the precursor to everything in the strong. Finally, closing opposition says that, oh, struggle is something that we have to avoid. Obviously, one, this is more speculative, but more importantly, I would just note that a lot of people are struggling today as well. So presumably, it's just not clear what the comparative is. We win the round on this.
I like clearly audible. Or should I use the mic? I think the UI is preferably from opening it up and I'll start in three, two, one. Right, panel, we are the only side to tell you today that why it is uniquely beneficial to be born in 2023, right? And what is the Rasha only clarified to you so far? Many things, right? Firstly, we are currently at the cusp of things, right? We're currently like working towards like space exploration and like really cool things like that. But like 100 years later, when like a lot of these things are already discovered to a great extent, the satisfaction to contribute towards this then when it is not a unique idea anymore diminishes, right? The Rasha only put to you with several instances why it's like go is diminishing and then 100 years later the ability to be able to contribute this will, will want to reduce drastically but to also mean that as a human being i will gain a less amount of satisfaction when i am contributing to it at all right but also no side is proving to you why why tech is like currently advancing or like going to reach its peak in 100 years why simultaneously climate change is not getting worse right how is tech leading climate change but if i use their own metric and their own understanding that in the past 100 years since climate change is working faster than tech has and if and we're not being able to like undo it if i use their own metric then they are failing right because climate change is working significantly faster than tech based on their metric and this will continue to happen based on their own metric which is why they're out right but going specifically house by house and telling you why they use right what is the push we get from opening government right two things are important and or two things like are their definition of what better is right one is that like agency is more 100 years later and that's why people are better off and two is that like the sort of like tech is more and like lives are better because tech is more right we disagree with both of these assertions and this is why right? they talk about how living a longer life is necessarily living a better life we do not see why that is true, right? The amount of agency that you have in your lifespan decreases towards the end of your lifespan, right? So by their metric of agency, I'm going to be older for longer, right? They've not told you how tech will like magically fight this whole concept of aging in and of itself, but like it is proven and like we've seen it for time on end, but as I'm growing older, my agency and ability to physically be able to do things and my autonomy is reducing based on my lifespan, right? Why do I want to live 220 when I have literally no agency can, and can barely move? And I don't see why medicine is progressing to that extent, but like now I have complete agency even when I'm aged like fucking 110, right? I'd rather die at 60 having like complete agency. We don't see why a long life is necessarily making people happier or adding any form of utility to life, right? According to me, like, and like as Rasha already showed it to you, like life is better, like you know, short span of time is always giving you more satisfaction. The sort of satisfaction that only exists on our side when you're actually contributing towards like some form of change and like things are not already better off, right? But why are Social movement also better off, right? Opening up comes and tells you that like poverty doesn't look as bad as poverty looks like today, but then we tell you like when poverty stops looking this bad, like it stops existing in an office and it stops being a problem, there is not enough like social political capital to work towards change away, right? This is why opening up and uses by their own metrics of like agency and like technology, which we do not believe to be like beneficial, right? When they tell you like hunters and gatherers got bored, like why are we necessarily believing this assertion that like hunters and gatherers have lived like an extremely like non-fulfilling life, but tech has literally proved to like shorten our lifespan and make us more susceptible to getting bored or to living like an unengaging life, right? Why are attention spans at an all-time low right now? Because tech is what led to this and like more tech is not solving this problem. It's probably making our lives more boring and probably making us live like a more monotonous life, right? But then why do we take it over opening opposition? It's because they spoke about like sure. only, yeah, I don't think you on that. Yeah, is already accepted because they have the same make that they say that this will be for the the over time. We prove to you that that is at least a larger harm than getting bored in the tech. Right, okay, we tell you, wait, wait, now does that make sense? I'm not even going to get into this, but like, we tell you like two things. Firstly, that like life for like the average individual, regardless of whether like a minority community or a majority community is better off on our side, we also give you like unique benefits as to why like 2023 is the perfect time to be born, right? We tell you like, even though like life is, we, which brings me to my next point about like why we need to about like closing down as well, right? We talk about how immigration increases and how like the we all end all of life is to somehow land yourself in a developed country and everyone's goal is to somehow live in this country because there exists like more money over there and like better access to resources. We don't necessarily see why that's true, right? Currently, the places that have the most development are not the places that 
uh, have the most like happy people or like people satisfaction is not maximized in the developed world right now. We see like islands where people literally live like the most like fucking hippie lifestyle ever are like happier than like people who are stuck in their fucking desk job. Right? We speak about like work life balance and say that like work life balance is better when I'm working a tech job, which makes absolutely no sense because like my employer has like fucking 24 7 access to me at this point because of tech in comparison to when this didn't exist and when tech is getting better on my paradigm. How the fuck is like work life balance also simultaneously getting better? Something we don't see, but also we don't necessarily agree that like the developed world is like the be all end all is the goal that everyone needs to fulfill, right? Which I think it's better to be part of like a developing nation and like have more yeah. talent that can to contribute and towards something than like move to the developed world or like rely on the developed world, right? We don't think that like either of these like necessitate or like either of these extremes necessitate the best quality of life, right? We, we're the only side to come and tell you that like the like we can't quantify happiness and that's like mutually inexclusive, but we can quantify like satisfaction. We tell you like satisfaction is maximized on our side of the house and like a lot of shit still needs to be done. And like it is a pretty decent time to be born, right? Like we like clearly see that like in no if, if we go by like their metric as like in the last hundred years like social change is have like has happened to a certain extent so it will continue to happen one there's no certainty as to like why that is necessarily true but even if we take them at their best case and like we're extremely charitable to like half their assertion we still tell you why it's better to be born like right now right when the Russia comes and tells you that like the mental health crisis is like exploding all over the world and like climate change is basically gonna like grow even like further than using their metric of how like like tech is also advancing climate change is still getting worse and we tell you it's better to like work like a fucking agricultural job at least i'm not like digging my back sitting in like this fancy office with where like my physical health is suffering and my employer has like 24 7 access to me which is even doing worse right one of the four things we've proven to you and like why does this mean that we like clearly take the debate right one we tell you that with tech getting better and like more access to medicine in a longer life this increases human suffering because like aging is not like magically reversed and like they haven't seen or told you like why autonomy is bought if you're like fucking hundred and your autonomy is anyway diminished. But we also told you that like having more knowledge of what's happening in all parts of the world is kind of worse, right? Like I was fucking much happier at like the age of two years old when I knew nothing about the world than when I had access to like so much information that just negatively impacted me and made me feel more shitty about like everything that's happening, right? I'd rather fucking not know what's happening in the world, be oblivious and like live in that oblivion, then no way more and be like so veiled and constantly have the sort of knowledge, right? We tell you like more death means like shorter attention spans and so like less happiness, but like we tell you that happiness is not even the kind of satisfaction and what the only side is to you why that satisfaction is maximized on our side. We tell you we don't want knowledge, we don't want more power, we don't want like more tech and we don't think develop nations of the be all and all the goal of every person to like reach to that specific phase, right? We tell you that like like the purpose of life is not to just like have material wealth or like it's to like feel good about yourself and like people in the most like developed countries right now are still not even good about themselves so by, for all those reasons it's several more very <laughs>